Douglas and Amy Nesbitt, and both of his sisters, Crepalum Allison and ninth grader Eve. Also, he has countless other special guests here, um, so welcome. <laughs> Daniel joined us in the ninth grade. He has been involved in soccer, where he is currently co-captain, basketball, and he is the president of HEC and the member of NHS. Outside of school, Daniel enjoys playing guitar with the band Undecided, eating all types of food, and above all, listening to music. Welcome, Daniel. In this world, there are a few things that absolutely everyone loves. For example, puppies. <laughs> puppies, ice cream, and Mr. Crawford's puns. <laughs> you know, the, the essentials. But to the entire human race, something perhaps even more beloved than these is music. As of November 2018, there were 191 million monthly active users of Spotify. 56 million subscribers on Apple Music, 78 million on Pandora. And if you then add the countless millions more listening to the radio, plus maybe two or three old souls still using a Walkman, that's a lot of people listening to music on a daily basis. So basically, everyone likes music. Be that as it may, no one likes the exact same type of music. Everyone has their preferences, or music taste. For example, when I told Jamie Rosenblum to listen by Millionaire by Queens of the Stone Age, she texted me back, are you okay? <laughs> she just liked the song so much that she wanted to make sure I still had a grasp of my sanity. And that's perfectly fine. But what I want to know is what is it that makes our taste so different? Why is it that whenever Hyatt takes the aux cord, I suddenly find the urge to drive off a cliff? <laughs> This is true. However, it does not explain the drastic differences in taste between close friends and family. So I decided to ask my friend, William Mayfield, where his music taste comes from. It didn't help at all. <laughs> so, luckily for me, science is here to provide some answers. A New York best-selling author and economist named Seth Stevens Davidowitz published an article in the New York Times where he analyzed listening data from Spotify. He found that the majority of people's, uh, for the majority of people, there's a certain period in their lives in which music taste develops the most that dictates what music they listen to for the rest of their lives. For women, this age is 13, whereas for men, it is 14. And women statistically are more influenced by these childhood preferences. Here, the Abiduits has separated all the listeners of a song by their age. If we look at uh, That's the Way Love Goes by Janet Jackson, we can see that the song rates highest with, or is most commonly listened to, by 35-year-old women, or those that were 11 when this song was released. Stephen Davidowitz analyzed multiple songs in this way and discovered, when he averaged the data out, that a song is most popular among women who were 13 years old when the song came out. Similarly, for men, each song is most popular among the group that was, on average, 14 years old when the song was released. This is kind of scary, though. If everyone's music tastes were locked at the age of 13 or 14, all of my classmates would be bumping nothing but pop music from 2010 to 2005. And honestly, I wouldn't be too you know, mad about that. <laughs> but Stephen Davidowitz also reports that music taste <laughs> continued to develop into the 20s, oh, um, into the late 20s. So there is hope. Um, <laughs> However, this does not explain why I love certain bands like Radiohead or The Strokes, whose major works were released before I was even born, like OK Computer in 1997 and Is This It in 2000. So obviously there's a little more to it. Andre Viscontis is a classically trained opera singer, a respected neuroscientist, and the author of the book How Music Can Make You Better. Viscontis is a faculty member of both the San Francisco Conservatory of Music and the University of San Francisco, and she proposed the idea 
that music taste develops alongside the brain during adolescence. In our teen years, quote, our brains are feverishly wiring up, particularly in our prefrontal cortex, which isn't fully formed until our 20s. Add to that powerful concoction of hormones that send us on wild emotional rides, ensuring that we remember the very good and the very bad as we learn to navigate the world on our own, this creates the perfect recipe for developing music taste. She even mentions how teens might start listening to music their parents don't like so as to separate themselves during adolescence, even if this music is not necessarily good. These ideas seem logical to me, because I see a lot of parallels between Visconti's theory and how my own music taste has developed. I remember listening to the song Paranoid Android by Radiohead almost every morning in ninth grade. The song is epic and jarring, like a sudden karate kick to the face, <laughs> but, in, but in a good way. And, uh, <laughs> I remember my parents absolutely hating it. I kept listening to the song through my sophomore year, so much so that for my birthday, my parents got me uh, tickets to a Radiohead concert in Atlanta, and it was incredible. Since then, I've been a huge fan, and Radiohead has totally shaped my music taste, leading me to other bands like The Strokes, Ween, Unmore Orchestra, Pink Floyd, and even Earl Sweatshirt. But to this day, I still mostly just listen to Radiohead. So I believe Enjoy Wisconsin's ideas to be true. I think teenage years are essential in determining one's music taste, not only because of the development that occurs in the brain, but also since we are figuring out who we are, what we want to do with our lives, who we want to be, and who we want to be with, or, you know, something like that. <laughs> Looking back, Mayfield's response is actually not that bad of an answer at all. Since William was 15 at the time of this certain experience, it supports Wisconsin's theory that adolescence is def the defining period for music taste. It also supports Stephen Davidowitz's proposal that people who listen to a song the most were somewhere between the ages of 8 to 18 when the song was released. I even have some data from my own grade to support these claims. Over the past three days, I have asked all the seniors for their favorite or one of their favorite songs. This is definitely a difficult question, a difficult question, but every senior has responded to think, and I've compiled what they've sent me, and the results line up perfectly with the Davidowitz and Discontis ideas. For example, one of Natalie Lyu's favorite songs, Party in the USA, is from 2009, meaning that was around eight when it came out. Gold Digger, sent by McNeil, <laughs> is also from 2009. Monster from Abuka, 2010. <laughs> the Show Goes On, from Molly, 2011. And keep in mind, each of these songs is just one of the many that these people enjoy. Yet their first choice, be it well thought out or on a whim, just so happens to be from the exact time Viscontis and Stephen Davidowitz said they would be. <laughs> In this chart, we can see all the favorite songs from the class of 2019. There are plenty of old songs mentioned, but the majority of the songs are from the 2000 label. So, both Davidowitz and Viscontis make legitimate claims, even in this sorry excuse for statistical analysis. <laughs> Thus, my adolescence and all the experiences that have shaped me and who I am are the same factors that have shaped my music taste. My favorite song is Where I End and You Begin, which was playing when y'all came in, by Radiohead. And that is not just a fun fact about me. It is a testament to my taste, to my identity, even. So as y'all watch these people and their favorite songs roll by, know this. There is no such thing. <laughs> There is no such thing as bad taste in music. <laughs> but actually, good music is subjective. It is a totally different concept for each person uh, in the world. So yeah, some of these might be... <laughs> they might be less... <laughs> it might be less of a serious personal choice for a favorite song. <laughs> but that is not for us to judge. I mean, yes, that is hilarious. But we don't know if this song is truly <laughs> meaningful for someone else. I mean, we don't. Only you know how a song makes you feel. <laughs> Basically, what I want y'all to 
takeaway for today is this. Your music taste is your own, and that is the way it ought to be. Music is one of the most beloved parts of life for many people. It wakes us up. Music, it comforts us when we are feeling low. It helps us celebrate our highs, and it puts us to sleep. But only certain songs work. Only music from your taste can unlock these secret joys. In this way, the music you prefer is more than just a daily pastime. It is part of it. So never change it for anything. And to you, my fellow seniors, thank you for showing me the awesome stuff you listen to. Just from a couple hundred texts, I've found tons of songs that I actually really like, surprisingly enough. And a couple that I don't. <laughs> but that's just the way it is. If we all like the same thing, music taste wouldn't exist. Every song would sound the same. Draining life of a lot of variety and flavor. So even if you're not a mega fan of Brandon Hill, even if you're not a mega fan of Radio, trust me when I tell you. <laughs> now, this is the truth. Your music taste isn't garbage. It is gold. And just so y'all know, Dalton Law helped me make a Spotify playlist of all the songs that were sent in. So if anyone needs something to listen to, uh, I'll be sharing it around. <laughs> Actually, a couple more. 